प्रति Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on Southeast Asia in the shadow of a rising China. We are speaking uh, here with um, uh, Sebastian Strangio, Southeast Asia editor for the Diplomat. Um, I will not read this bio, which is very extensive. We'll, what we'll do is um, we'll, we'll paste the uh, link to his website on the chat uh, screen. Uh, but let me just see how I. Got to know um, Sebastian. I first came across his work when uh, I read his book on Unsin, it's called Unsin Cambodia. And you know, there is there, 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 there basically two ways of writing about Cambodia. One way is to write an angry book uh, with um, heroes and villains, uh, very simple minded sort of bad versus evil and all that. Sorry, <laughs> good versus evil and all that. Uh, and you know that is not how I found later on. That's not how Sebastian wrote it. He gave a more complex picture. He gave he 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 stood back a bit and said, hey, "Hang on, it's not so simple." And that is exactly how he has approached this new book that is this written. Uh, this book is called "In the Dragon Shadow: Southeast Asia in China's Century." Uh, you know, this conversation today. Will be centered around that book. Again, he has taken a step back and said, "Hang on, it's not as simple. It is. Not, we don't have the luxury of, um, you know, luxury of simple binaries. Basically, it is not just about whether China is going to choose one side over the other, China or United States. It's a lot more broad than that. It's more complex than that. And that is, and that is how uh, I think." Um, you know, I, I think how this conversation will be very useful uh, by sort of unpacking some of the complexities in Southeast South Asia China relations. Um, with me today, uh, I'm Shaiman, by the way, I'm with uh, the Foreign Policy and Security Studies Program of Association. With me is my colleague Thomas Benjamin Daniel. Um, he's going to be the ringleader for today's discussion. Uh, Thomas, can I ask you to tell us uh, how we get to go about this? Thank you, Sharima. Uh, this is going to be very simple. I think uh, Sebastian will probably speak for about 20, 25 minutes, and then we go into uh, a question, question and answer session. So um, the, the way the Q&A will be conducted is simple. You type in your questions. Uh, I do believe you get to vote and to like questions. So questions that are upvoted will probably uh, be, uh, be, uh, be asked first. Uh, that, that, at the end, it's at the discretion of the moderators. Perhaps halfway through, we might, uh, if there is real interest by some of the participants, uh, by some of the attendees, if there are burning questions, uh, please utilize the uh, raise hand function, and we might try to get you to uh, ask, an, uh, ask an audio question to Sebastian. Uh, but that is it for now. Uh, Sharma, back to you. So, uh, Sebastian, um well, I, 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 I know how to, uh, what's the best way to do uh, stuff like, um, have this segue to you, but, uh, you know, if you, yeah, we'll ask you to speak for about 20 minutes or so, and now we'll go into Q&A. Uh, All right, wonderful. Sharman, thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, and my only regret is that I couldn't be there in person. I think COVID has, you know, put restrictions on us all. And, and um, you know, this, this for me is, um, one of the main impacts. I'll be promoting this book mostly from my office here in Adelaide. Um, yeah, so as you as you pointed out, you know, um, in your introduction, I mean, this new book really does have its roots in the um, uh, the work that I did in Cambodia, where I lived from for about eight years as a journalist, um, writing on the country and, and, and the wider region as well. Um, Cambodia offered a very interesting um, ringside seat to the changes that were happening in Southeast Asia and the, in the resurgence of Chinese um, power in the region. I mean, in the eight years that I was in the country, um, China became the country's leading investor, its leading source of tourists, and its number one trade partner. The visible investment presence um, uh, 
of China was, you know, was every year becoming more evident. You know, the Chinese made bridges were uh, arcing across the, the nation's rivers. Chinese made highways were opening up um, isolated parts of the country. And Chinese real estate projects and high rises were reshaping the skyline of the capital Phnom Penh. And there was another way in which Cambodia is also, you know, has a very interesting, uh, offers a very interesting angle on, you know, the rise of Chinese influence in the world. And that's the fact that Cambodia was, you know, in the early 90s had become a symbol of a new, a different type of uh, world that was emerging. This was the end of the Cold War, the era of the end of history. Um, Cambodia was subject to a $2 billion UN peacekeeping mission designed to end the country's civil war and refashion the country as a liberal democracy. And this, this project was very, you know, very much reflected the liberal triumphalism that came at the end of the Cold War and the, the sort of hope and expectation that this period of, of superpower conflict would give way to a period of converging liberal values globally. And you know, what you mentioned in your intro about this sort of camp typical Cambodia story being this good versus evil type thing, this reflects, I think, very much that sense that, you know, everything good and true was coming to Cambodia. And when, when that failed to eventuate, um, you know, th that, you know, that was uh, as a result of sort of, um, must have been the result of some sort of evil machinations or outside um, uh, intervention in Cambodia's affairs that prevented it from getting to that point. And, of course, the role of China in that regard is quite interesting, given that um, it has supported Prime Minister Hun Sen and given him the, the, you know, the freedom of maneuver to sort of refashion Cambodian politics, um, you know, in line with his own interests and essentially abrogate this, this great nation building, democracy building project that was initiated by the UN nearly 30 years ago. Um, so, you know, as I began to see Cambodia as, 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 as um, signaling a, a wider shift, I started to travel more widely as well. And I reported on a whole lot of different things, but I, you know, always kept an eye on, um, you know, China's presence in the region. And, and I tried to get a sense of how this epical development of China's resurgence after, you know, a century and a half of, of dormancy and, and, and uh, internal upheaval was being felt and experienced and responded to in different parts of the region. And, you know, to summarize, you know, the, the views that I, you know, the very diverse views that I encountered across the region, I think it's accurate to say that, you know, Southeast Asia views China, you know, its views towards China are deeply fraught and anguished. On the one hand, you have the lure of economic opportunity of China's, you know, uh, if it's anything, it's, it's, you know, in many ways, a great economic miracle. And there's a lot of benefits to being plugged into China's economy and, and hitching yourself to that, to that uh, freight train. Um, but this also coexists with a great deal of fear and trepidation about what a powerful China will mean, about, uh, mean for the region's future. Um, and so this state of tension between apprehension and opportunity is really the essence of the China-Southeast Asia relationship. And of course, this tension has only been increased further by the in the context of the increased rivalry between China and the United States and the tensions that have resulted from that. So at the fundamental level, I think Southeast Asia's present relations with China are deeply informed by the reality of geographic proximity. The two regions for centuries have been bound together by ties of trade, tribute, um, large movements of people between the two regions. <clears throat> And, you know, historically, the, the line between what was Southeast Asia and what was China, of course, these are very recent concepts, was hazy. Um, the southern province of Yunnan uh, once had more in common with the Buddhist kingdoms of mainland Southeast Asia than it did with the, the center of Chinese civilization in the Yellow River Valley. And similarly, the, Ch the southern Chinese people who traveled in large numbers and settled in the Malay Archipelago and other parts of Southeast Asia had as much in common with the people of Vietnam as they did with those of the Yellow River Valley. So, you know, today this proximity um, or these connections have reawakened in the context of China's economic reemergence. And I think, um, you know, this proximity remains the defining and unifying characteristic of China Southeast Asia relations. Um, the two regions in many ways are, are, are bound more closely together than at any point in history. 
For China, Southeast Asia, because of its proximity, Southeast Asia is a region of crucial strategic importance. This has its um, roots in the you know, basic you know, uh, security um, uh, dilemma that, that China faces. If you look out from Beijing, from the perspective of Beijing, China's neighborhood looks like a very claustrophobic place. Um, you know, the country is hemmed in by powerful rivals armed with nuclear weapons. And um, US treaty allies, including the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, and, and, and Taiwan, of course, which has a very close relationship with the United States. The one place that China does not face, you know, there is, not, uh, there is no um, single dominant power, is um, to the South. Um, Southeast Asia is the one place where China perceives that it can break the chain of encirclement that Chinese strategists have always perceived to be closing in around it. Um, and, you know, this consideration became more and more pressing as China's economy became more and more reliant on uh, its access to world markets um, for its exports and also for the import of um, crude oil from the Middle East via the Straits of Malacca. And so, you know, I think this is really the fundamental consideration um, behind China's, you know, uh, expansive claims to the South China Sea. I mean, for all its talk about historical claims and traditional fishing grounds. This is basically, this basically reflects China's need or perceived need to establish security over the vital sea lanes of communication upon which its economy relies. And I think that all of the, the talk about historical claims and, 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 and sort of the nationalist fervor that is attached to this question exists downstream of this basic consideration. Um, throw in as well, a, you know, um, resentment at you know, Western interference and meddling during the so-called century of humiliation, and you have a very combustible package. Um, so, but the, the same things that make Southeast Asia a particularly important region for China um, also make it a particularly challenging one. I mean, for Southeast Asia, China's proximity has always been a mixed blessing. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, opportunity has always coexisted and interacted with apprehension. Um, and in recent years, you know, this, this tension is, has increased as China's proximity has increased. Um, in the mainland parts of Southeast Asia, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia, new infrastructure networks have broken down what was once a thick and impermeable, impermeable barrier um, that, that divided these, these mainland Southeast Asian nations from um, China and the centers of Chinese state power. The resulting network of uh, highways, rail lines, and special economic zones has opened the Mekong region to a transformative southward sweep of Chinese investment and immigration. Um, and the damming of the Mekong River uh, on its upper reaches by the Chinese government um, has also given Chinese dam engineers the ability to um, impact the livelihoods of millions of people downstream. Um, and there is, you know, a, a considerable amount of evidence to show that, you know, the withholding of water by these dams has, has exacerbated drought conditions down, downstream uh, in countries like Cambodia and Thailand. Um, at sea, we also see a similar collapsing of distance. Um, you know, over the past few decades, China has broken with its, you know, traditional land-bound inward looking orientation and ventured out into the oceans, building up a naval force capable of projecting power far from its shores and establishing control over these sea lanes of communication um, that I mentioned before. Um, historically, you know, this is even more anomalous in a sense, you know, the, 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 Chinese, the Chinese state was rarely a, a maritime power, except for a brief period during the Ming Dynasty when, when um, uh, China sent forth large um, armadas um, uh, through the Indian Ocean and, and through Southeast Asia. This is really, um, the, the Chinese state concentrated most of its attention inwards towards the north, um, where, you know, most, where, where the main security threats have traditionally come. Um, and so uh, the, you know, since the 1980s, um, we've seen this shift where, you know, China's moved towards the establishment of you know, a, a powerful Navy and the, and the development of, um, you, know, a, a, you know, a force that's capable of sort of securing these, um, these vital sea lanes. 
Um, and as on the mainland, we've seen, you know, this has also been anchored by mammoth infrastructure projects. Um, you know, in, the ca in this case, we're, we're talking about um, the, the reclamation of massive artificial islands in disputed parts of the South China Sea. Um, and, um, you know, for countries that, that are uh, the maritime nations of Southeast Asia, you know, this has brought China and the Chinese state and Chinese military power um, to, you know, in some cases, you know, a few score kilometers um, from, from territory um, that these nations claim. So, you know, at land and at sea, um, you know, China is closer uh, to Southeast Asia in many ways than at any point in history. Um, and this, this growing proximity and this collapsing of distance um, has only compounded the concerns that, you know, and, and brought to the surface concerns um, that have long existed about China's, um, you know, power in the region. It's recalled memories of China's support for communist insurgencies during the Cold War and, and sort of reawakened the vexed question of China's relationship to the region's ethnic Chinese uh, diaspora communities, a fear which in many ways predates the establishment of the PRC in 1949. Um, uh, Another recent problem for China has been the sort of imperious attitude that, that has accompanied its return to wealth and power um, over the past couple of decades. Um, China's rise seems to have been accompanied by an assumption that as the largest nation and economy in Southeast Asia or in, in the wider Asian region, Southeast Asian states should defer to Chinese wishes. And in cases where they resist doing so, this is very often seen as a result of ill intention or the malign influence of outside powers for which read the United States. Um, I think this reflects to a certain degree the sort of blindness and self-centeredness and solipsism that affects all large powers. But I think, you know, in China's case, we can also identify, you know, we can connect this to the, um, the authoritarian nature of the Chinese communist state, as well as a residue of the sort of middle kingdom syndrome um, that, that, you know, a hangover from the, from the imperial era when China not only viewed itself as the most civilized, um, you know, empire in the world, but the very definition of civilization itself. And so these things continue, I think, there's a sort of overlay that continues to sort of affect China's relationship with this region. Um, and, um, you know, we see this expressed in, in you know, the China's awkwardness with public diplomacy in the region. It's, it's in, you know, inability to sort of address the criticisms and concerns that it's a lot of its investments um, and its widening economic footprint in the region uh, uh, have prompted. Um, and, and in some cases, even to understand how China's um, you know, actions could have prompted these things in the first place. Um, in this category, we should also include the you know, attempts to broaden outreach to the region's ethnic Chinese populations. This remains, I think, one of the most dangerous and potentially combustible uh, examples of China's official blindness. Um, and, you know, I think in, in certain countries where ethnic Chinese uh, have always maintained a precarious foothold in the national community, China's increased outreach to these communities, you know, runs the risk of reawakening old fears about dual loyalties on the part of the ethnic Chinese. Um, so, you know, for all the, the sort of concerns that, um, that Southeast Asian nations have about China, there is also, you know, uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily falling in line with the, the, what is now the predominant American position on, on China, which depicts China not only as a threat to its neighbors in certain respects, but also, you know, a threat to the very idea of freedom itself. Um, as Sharman mentioned in his introduction, I mean, you know, I mentioned in the book that, that Southeast Asia does not enjoy the luxury of simple binaries. The reality is that in most ways, a prosperous and stable China is in Southeast Asia's interest. I think a lot of Southeast Asians remember well that when, you know, China experienced periods of civil war or internal collapse, this very often translated into destabilizing flows of people southward. Um, and I think a similar sort of collapse or, or upheaval in China today would have unimaginable consequences on the nations lying to its south. They also prefer, I think, um, in general, the China of today to the China of Mao Zedong, which, you know, was actively seeking to stoke 
communist insurgencies against sitting governments in the region. Um, so as much as they might fear or oppose, you know, fear its power or oppose its behavior, China has become, has developed into the vital economic partner, if not the most prominent economic partner to virtually every nation in the region. And Chinese schemes like the Belt and Road Initiative uh, are, you know, while posing challenges for the region, also have definite attractions, um, especially for the poorer developing nations in mainland Southeast Asia. And so for this reason, the, the region has generally chosen to take part in these uh, initiatives, reckoning or betting that the risks of, part the risks of participation um, are outweighed by the benefits. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the reality of geographic proximity and the, and the sort of resulting economic entanglements that that has produced have made, some, have made China something that the nations of Southeast Asia can't feasibly ignore or wish away. Um, it also tends to make them resistant to signing up to any US-led alliance or coalition of states aimed either explicitly or otherwise at containing China's power. There are also other important uh, areas of overlap and interest that are often overlooked in the West. Um, and chief among these, I think, is the common anti-colonial political orientation of China and the Southeast Asian nations. I mean, both regions experienced the contusions of Western and Japanese imperial assault in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and I think that, you know, they both experienced the sort of wrenching um, uh, sort of dislocations that this produced, not only the, the reality of conquest, but also the, the um, searing self-examination uh, that resulted from these, you know, the, the collapse in the face of, face of Western power. So I think, you know, you can eat, if you read sort of um, uh, Prime Minister Mahathir's um, uh, book, The Malay Dilemma, you, you actually hear a lot of echoes of similar things that the, the Chinese reformers were saying in the 19th century. Um, about, you know, the, the lamenting the inability of the Malay people to um, sort of, um, you know, uh, stand up against colonial rule and against um, the dominance of ethnic Chinese in Malaysia. This, this sort of, this echoes quite closely things that Chinese um, thinkers were saying in the 19th century about Chinese culture and the Chinese people and their inability, apparent inability to sort of meet the challenge posed by the Western powers. And so this shared experience of Western colonial rule has had a number of um, you know, has inculcated a number of common perspectives in the two regions. Um, the most notable of these is the, the deep commitment to the norm of national sovereignty and the extreme allergy to any hint uh, of impingement on um, what a nation views as its internal affairs, right? And, and you know, this has been backed by, a, you know, um, very keen nationalisms that are very sensitive to any, any hint of um, uh, you know, a foreign nation transgressing on, on things that are, you know, that lie within the remit of, of that state. Um, and so, you know, this has implications for Southeast Asia's relationship with the West. Um, in recent years, we've seen again and again, um, when Western governments have been, you know, most outspoken in their criticisms of Southeast Asian nations over human rights questions or democratic backsliding, you know, they very often turn to China for, uh, you know, quote, no strings support. Um, and, th and this is true even as China's own actions demonstrate its own imperial potential. Um, uh, I, so for all these reasons, I think Southeast Asia has, has, you know, is suspicious of and concerned about the sudden hostile turn in American views towards China. Um, the research and writing of this book coincided with, you know, a sharp, um, you know, reassessment of uh, American views toward China and, and the establishment of a very rapid bipartisan consensus about China, which, you know, must be one of the few consensuses that exist between the two parties um, in the United States today. Um, you know, in general, we all, we're all familiar with the, the outlines of this new consensus, but in general, it, it depicts China as a predatory power that bullies its neighbors, a power that seeks to export its authoritarian political model and uses debt traps to ensnare small developing nations. Um, the current American administration has been particularly fond at framing the China challenge in ideological terms as a global struggle between freedom and authoritarianism. 
Um, and this image is typically set alongside a sanitized and idealized vision of American primacy and the US-led rules-based international order that China is allegedly working to overthrow. Um, but I think you know, the depiction of US-China competition as an all or nothing struggle um, between democracy and dictatorship has failed to gain a lot of purchase in Southeast Asia. I think, you know, for one thing, I think the region remembers that the, you know, the forging of this liberal international order that the Americans are so fond of talking about, you know, was a pretty unsavory business. It, you know, it involved the use of Ameri you know, huge amounts of force in Indochina, which involved you know, carpet bombings and you know, um, a long and destructive American intervention in Vietnam. And it involved support for you know, um, autocrats in um, allied powers like the Indonesia, the Philippines, and Thailand. Um, so I think you know, the, this, is, this is all made Southeast Asian nations resistant to sort of signing up to this sort of very stark vision of US-China competition. I think in general, um, Southeast Asian nations see no reason in principle why they can't continue to enjoy fruitful economic ties with China and, and, and good security ties with the United States, even when those powers are in fierce disagreement in certain domains. Um, but all this puts, you know, a, a, as the tensions continue to escalate between these two superpowers, it puts Southeast Asia in, in a really uncertain liminal bind between the two powers. Um, you know, the lure and opportunity of China and the fear and apprehension about its expanding power thus exist in a sort of dialectical relationship, feeding back and forth into one another and producing a deep ambivalence about what this development means for the region. Um, but as tensions with the United States escalate, um, this is placing additional strains on Southeast Asia's ability, both as a region and as individual states to maintain a degree of strategic autonomy. Um, so in conclusion, you know, the, the emergence of a more powerful, ambitious and belligerent China and the assertive actions taken by rivals like the United States to curb Chinese ambition has posed every nation in Southeast Asia with a similar challenge. How best to navigate um, and benefit from this new power's rise without compromising national sovereignty or succumbing to onerous Chinese demands over the long run. Within these broad parameters, however, each nation in Southeast Asia has met this challenge uh, in its own way, within the limits available to them. Um, both within and between countries, there's a great deal of um, divergence in perceptions of China and in the responses that nations have taken uh, to accommodate or uh, resist its rise. Um, and, you know, with, with relations between China and the US now in free fall, you know, this um, competition, this challenge is becoming more and more acute. Um, the balancing act tricky to maintain. At the same time, however, Southeast Asia has always been a crossroad of superpowers and empires. And in some senses, no region is, is more well equipped in terms of its history and strategic culture to bend with the changing regional winds and preserve its freedom of maneuver in a new age of superpower competition. Thank you. Thanks very much, Destina. If, if there was a way to sort of like a, you know, channel of people's cracks, I'm sure it would be quite a, quite a, quite a long one. Um, Destin, before we take questions uh, on, on, from the Q&A um, window, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, how, how long was this? How, how long did it take you to, to write? I, I remember you coming over to KL some years ago, I just kind of my finger on what year it was. Uh, you, you've been traveling around, around the region for some time for this book, haven't you? Yeah, this, this book is based loosely on reporting that I've done over the past decade. Um, I was in KL about three years ago, uh, 2017, um, if I recall, um, we were around this time in 2017. Um, uh, but yeah, the, I did a few purpose, um, you know, you know, trips specifically to research uh, elements of this book, but I also, you know, drew on reporting that I'd done, especially in the mainland parts of Southeast Asia, um, dating back to 2008. Um, and, and you know, I've sort of gathered information and, and um, opinion over those, over those years. Um, and the book took me about two years to write and research, but then there was a long process of revision and I had to do some frenzied last minute updates to accommodate the, the recent changes due to the coronavirus pandemic, which is, you know, um, 
thrown a new element into the mix of US-China competition and really heightened the tensions that were already quite um, alarming um, at the time that the pandemic hit. Right, but uh, you know, I was just looking at the book, I guess, the, um, you know, your after chapter, it ends at 61% of the book, I begin to mention, you know, just, show, just goes to show the, the extensive notes that come together with the book, you know, it's, uh, it's quite, quite amazing stuff. Um, when, while you were traveling the region, uh, especially if I may ask around maritime South Asia, what aspect of the relationship was the most surprising to you? Um, um, did it actually fit quite well with what you were expecting to hear, or were there a couple of themes that come out, came out a bit more than you expected? One thing that I, I was surprised to learn that, you know, for your average person or your average Malay person in, in Malaysia, um, your average Pribumi in Indonesia, you know, the question of China's maritime aggrandizement and its assertive behavior in the South China Sea is much less of an emotionally resonant issue than internal racial politics. I mean, I, I was astounded to learn the extent to which, you know, the question of the ethnic Chinese inclusion in the national communities of Malaysia and Indonesia still remains very much a question, a matter of dispute um, in certain quarters. Um, and that, you know, the, there are um, developments underway in both countries, um, nationalist currents that, you know, continue to view ethnic Chinese as outsiders to these communities. And that this is something that, that is much more of a live issue in the politics of these countries than what's happening in the South China Sea. I mean, I think when we spoke in KL, you, you pointed that out to me that, you know, you don't see the mass mobilizations um, of ordinary citizens over uh, James Scholl. Um, whereas in Vietnam, people will take to the streets at the slightest hint, even an imagined hint of Chinese interference. And, and you know, the Spratleys and Paracels have become, you know, resonant symbols of, of Vietnamese nationalism in a way that I just don't see has happened in Indonesia and Malaysia. The Philippines is a little different, that the ethnic Chinese of the Philippines are better assimilated, and that has a lot to do with the timing um, of Filipino nationalism, which predated the rise of Chinese nationalism, and therefore, you know, nationalism in, in the Philippines didn't really acquire an anti-Chinese valence to quite the same extent it, that it did in, say, Indonesia. Um, and I, I do detect a little bit more of a popular mobilization around the question of the South China Sea in the Philippines. But even then, you know, um, it's, you know, people, ordinary people in the Philippines have so many more things to worry about in their daily lives that this, this issue, you know, does excite people's, you know, um, opposition or, or, you know, but, it, but it's, it's not resulting in the sort of upheavals that pose a threat to the, the current government as it is in Vietnam, where anti-Chinese anti sentiment could, could really spiral out of control and threaten conceivably that, you know, that the Communist Party's hold on power. This is probably the most potent um, uh, you know, thing that exists in Vietnamese politics. And so, yeah, I was surprised um, by that. I, I, I've read about it in books, but it, I wasn't prepared for the, ex the extent to which it remains sort of a, you know, a, a hugely current and live issue in the politics of many of these countries. And when you spoke to people uh, about, you know, especially policymakers about how one should deal with China's engagement with overseas Chinese communities. What were the prescriptions that you thought were coming up? Were, were they, were they, was it more like fatalism, you know, China's too big, you can't do anything? Or is it, um, is it a confidence that, okay, we can, we can somehow communicate this with China and China, China can understand? Because I, for us, I think in, in this room at least, uh, we still don't know how, how, how to go about it. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't detect a great deal of fatalism. Um, I, I, you know, what I heard again and again is, you know, we understand China. We've been dealing with China for centuries. Uh, and we feel like we can handle it, that we can maintain this balance. Um, you know, now, when I was researching a lot of this book, you know, the tensions between the United States and China were, were still, you know, at the beginning of the Trump administration, it was still happening slowly. It, it, it hadn't... Um, spiraled out of control to the degree that it has. Um, but I did get a sense that, you know, Southeast Asian governments are aware that they have a certain degree of wiggle room and agency. And I think that the fact that the, the reality is that Southeast Asia is not 
you know, a, a, it doesn't face a binary choice. I mean, this is a naturally multipolar region where there are a lot of other outside powers that play significant roles in the region and, and could play, in the case of, say, India, a more significant role in the years to come. Um, and I think that the presence of all of these outside powers does give the Southeast Asian nations a certain degree of maneuver um, that I think that, that, you know, policymakers are well aware of that. Um, but I also think that, you know, when you look at public opinion on China, which, you know, in some countries is quite negative, um, you know, I think that governments in power realize that they, they don't have the freedom to, to totally, you know, in, you know, play to that public opinion in a way that they might want. And again, Vietnam is a very good example. I mean, the people as a whole, you know, public, public opinion surveys find, you know, rock bottom, uh, you know, attitudes towards China, um, you know, very negative across the board. But the Vietnamese Communist Party is in a really difficult position because it also, you know, has, a, has good reasons to want to maintain a, a workable relationship with the Chinese government. And so, you know, it's, it, it finds itself in a very tricky position. And any, any government that comes to power in Hanoi is going to face that dilemma. That's not something that, um, it, there are connections between the two communist parties in, in Hanoi and Beijing, you know, which, which, but I think any party in that, any government in that position would face that challenge. And so, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a certain amount of maneuverability, but I also think that governments in the region are, are realistic about <clears throat> the extent to which they rely upon China and they want good relations, good economic relations, particularly with it. Um, I'll, I'll pass it on to Thomas to the end of the uh, Q&A. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Shari, but, um, thank you, Sebastian. That was a tour de force of the book and the region. Uh, oh, we should talk about, and I'm pretty sure we're not going to get to all of them in time. Uh, just a reminder to our participants, uh, you can type in your questions to the, to the question and answer tab. Uh, you can like on them to, to upload uh, questions that you want asked. Uh, and again, but uh, the selection of that is really dependent on the moderators or me in this case. Um, so with that, uh, Sebastian, let's, uh, let's uh, start off with a question from um, Hunter Marston, uh, I think that uh, in, in Australia. Um, so um, his question is that given Southeast Asian, uh, given Southeast Asian countries uh, awareness of China's aggressive actions, in the, South China, in the South China Sea and the domineering attitude or interference in domestic politics. Why do Southeast Asian countries continue to hedge their bets between great powers? Are they unsure of the United States uh, maintaining its power and its presence? Or is it simply economic opportunities associated with China's rise? I think it's both. I think that you have, you know, these economic entanglements upon which, you know, which you know, the prosperity of Southeast Asia is very much uh, yoked to that of China um, after years of economic integration and increasing trade and investment. So there's obviously the, the, the need and desire to maintain that. I think there's also concern about current U.S. policy towards Southeast Asia, which, you know, on the one hand, speaks very tough about China and pledges America's undying commitment to the region. But, you know, I think there's, a, there's an awareness in the region that this American policy is you know, is, is geared overwhelmingly at, at, its, at its global rivalry with China. And that often Southeast Asian concerns or needs are sort of overlooked. You know, uh, the U.S. is looking across Southeast Asia towards its, its East Asian rival. And, um, you know, you see this with the sort of agnostic position that the region has taken on the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, the... Uh, the adoption of Huawei, Chinese 5G technology, um, and, and the unwillingness to sort of to, to, to block 5G out of national telecom systems just because the U.S. demands it. Um, I think that there's a sense that the U.S. hasn't really offered something in its place. There have been some announcements, some new programs. <clears throat> the U.S. Mekong Partnership, which was announced um, last week is, is one example of that. But the, the amounts of money attached to these initiatives are, um, you know, are relatively small compared to what China is offering. Um, and I think there's just an uncertainty. You know, American um, policy over the past couple of decades has, you know, has sort of has swung between episodic engagement and, um, you know, these sort of, uh, well, especially recently, these sort of barnstorming ideological broadsides against 
China and, and the sort of call to arms for the sort of global struggle against authoritarianism, which I don't think, you know, um, is, is, is a very welcome thing for, for the region. And I think there is some sort of concern about the longer term, if we're talking decades, um, you know, I think China's rise in this region is, you know, most Southeast Asian governments recognize that it's a reality and that there is a global shift of power and wealth taking place. Um, not just toward China, but India plays an important role in that as well. And that China is going to have to play a more significant global role. Um, and, you know, the, I think that Southeast Asian governments are ready to accept that. I mean, Prime Minister Lee Sin Lung of Singapore made that point in his Shangri-La dialogue speech in 2019 that, you know, it's, it's reasonable for China to want a greater say in global decision making. And, and the setting of global norms. And I think that South, this, is, this is where the shared anti-colonial sort of perspective comes in. I mean, Southeast Asian nations also feel like they weren't, you know, they weren't, they were colonies when a lot of these um, global institutions were set up um, by their colonial masters in the 1940s. Um, and so, um, or very recently uh, liberated therefrom. Um, and so I think that they're, yeah, I think the, there is there is a bit of a, there's a general uncertainty about both the future of American engagement, but also the sort of um, concern about American engagement being too robust and, and this sort of um, confrontational stance towards China spiraling into some kind of conflict that could put the region in a very difficult situation. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I I do have to say that uh, you know um, uh, while I do agree uh, with, with uh, some of what you mentioned, the sort of uh, I, you know blindness of by Beijing when it comes to approaching Southeast Asia, although I'm not sure right, whether that is willful blindness and in some cases. Uh, it, it Unfortunately, uh, it does seem that Beijing has a lot more nuance uh, compared to DC these days when it comes to, uh, and maybe not just these days, even, even going back throughout the decades when it comes to engaging with Southeast Asia, to sort of figure out the nuances of the region uh, much more better, which is which is really quite surprising. But, uh, but, but You know, considering that China is in many ways blind in its own way, to a lot of Southeast Asian concerns, um, yeah, I think you're. I think you're right. It is surprising. Thank you. Um, let's move to the next question. Uh, the next question is by Nazaran Zafri. Uh, Nazaran's question concerns what's happening in Xinjiang and whether what's happening there will have any impact on uh, Southeast Asian government's approach to China in the coming years, or are we likely to essentially ignore it? Uh, and, and, and if I can sort of supplement that, uh, I think uh, while, while most governments are happy to sort of not deal with it as much as we can, uh, public opinion in countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, uh, will eventually have some sort of pull on how our governments run on how governments uh, engage in foreign policy, especially possibly in Malaysia, where it looks unlikely that, 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 that governments will enjoy large majorities and more to act as they will. Do you, do you see this as a potential, uh, potential complication in the relationship? Well, it certainly looms as a potential complication. I mean, one of the regrets I have is that I didn't explore this issue in depth in the book. Um, I mean, when I was doing most of the research, obviously we knew about the horrible things that were going on in Xinjiang. But the recent revelations about the extent of these sort of um, re-education camps uh, and, and the sheer numbers of people that are imprisoned within them. Um, you know, if I was beginning to research the book now, I would definitely put more of an emphasis on this. Um, I think that, you know, so far we haven't really seen this develop into, uh, you know, appear or surface in the foreign policy of the, you know, the Muslim majority nations of Southeast Asia. Um, I, you know, get the sense that there is concern amongst sort of ordinary people about this and that there is, you know, um, rising discontent, especially as it connects to broader fears of China's rise in the region. Um, but I think that, you know, th this, is, this is likely to put, if it does become an issue of popular mobilization, will put the governments of Indonesia, Malaysia and Brunei in a, in a very difficult position because, um, well, perhaps not Brunei, I mean, Brunei is a, you know, is basically a you know absolute monarchy and so that they, they don't have to take into consideration public opinion to quite the same extent that Indonesia and Malaysia do um, and but I think that you know the governments will probably treat this as an issue or you know past president suggests that they'll treat this as an issue of, of you know China's internal affairs um, I, I think that there's too much at stake for them to really take a strong line on this in terms of investment and trade with China 
especially when you have governments like Jokowi's government in Indonesia that, you know, has explicitly sort of framed bilateral relationship around access to infrastructure funding and, you know, the utilization of China's ability in that regard. Um, so for the moment, I think that there's a certain stability there, but if, if this was to become a really serious um, subject of popular mobilization, it could put the governments in a very difficult place. But I think we should also recall that there was a lot of criticism and opposition in these countries to the American invasion of Iraq. Um, and, you know, and that, you know, I think that did sour relations to some degree, but, you know, it, it, a relationship with the, like a relationship with the United States, you know, governments, went out of their way to preserve that relationship and ensure that it, you know, mostly remained, you know, this, this, this tension didn't really affect core interests and core areas of interest. So, I, you know, I predict that it will probably, the governments will find a way to sort of uh, compartmentalize this, um, unfortunately, um, and, and to sort of, you know, I think that they're concerned, you know, the, the, the national sovereignty norm, as soon as you, you know, um, begin speaking out about another country's quote unquote internal affairs, then, you know, it's very easy for other countries to begin doing the same to you. And I think that that reciprocal kind of desire for, to, to not be lectured to, um, will probably ensure that governments in the region remain relatively silent about it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Um, but I think that's the most likely outcome. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. Um, let's move on to a question from Peter O'Hare. Um, uh, Peter wonders uh, what do Southeast Asian states make of Australia uh, standing up to the bullying from China? Um, the, is, is there a sort of leap on you or Marte style uh, haughty derision, or is there some kind of grudging respect towards Australia? And if, if, it, if it is the latter, what are prospects of a meaningful alliance? Uh, to protect uh, common interests in balancing security and economic concerns? Well, I think that, um, you know, that privately a lot of Southeast Asian governments will probably welcome the new Australian secu security strategy and its commitment to um, the region. I think the same concerns attach as to the American engagement with the region, which is that, you know, any anything that, that pushes the region closer to a potential conflict is, is obviously not in the region's interest. But I do think that, you know, the, the, the robust engagement of Australia with um, the nations of Southeast Asia will ultimately give the region added room for maneuver. Um, and because of course, Australia's interests and the current American administration, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a large amount of overlap, but there is also some distemper in Australia about the, the very stark ideological framing of this um, of this of this competition, given Australia's economic, you know, um, reliance on on China for you know an all number of domains, um, so I think that yeah, I think that generally it will be welcomed. But um, you know, there I, one thing I think is a concern is that Australia's been disinvesting in its diplomatic capacities, and that you know, um, the state of Australian higher education, uh, which is undermining our knowledge of Southeast Asia, um, you know, recent, recent um, pandemic related cuts, um, and, you know, the, you know, decades of underfunding have, have, you know, put us in a position where we're, you know, not producing the knowledge that we need to engage meaningfully with Southeast Asia. And the same thing is in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, there's also been cuts to key diplomatic posts in Asia. Um, and I think that this, you know, I think that this uh, particularly the latter, will be, is, is, you know, will, you know uh, undercut slightly the, the security commitment that was recently made by Canberra. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the next uh, question in the list. And this is by uh, Dr. Sharifa Mamira Alatas. Um, now, the question is that, uh, or rather the comment, uh, is that many in Southeast Asia feel that the narrative by large has been ignored, uh, has, has ignored the um, hegemonic tendencies of the United States. And uh, while it has uh, traditionally been a powerful hegemon, uh, and with China's rise, it is, it is obviously uh, in, in, in Asia as well. So really, it's, it's not just about China's misbehavior. It's probably about uh, existing uh, misbehavior by the United States as well. That's so, uh, more of a comment, but if you could get your, your, your response to that. Well, I think that um, 
I think that a lot of Southeast Asians recognize that the struggle between China and the United States doesn't, you know, Southeast Asia is the arena for this competition, but both of these powers are sort of increasingly obsessed with each other and, and focused beadily on, on, on each other. Um, and that, you know, this, I think that, you know, as regards the United States, I think one of the, one of the problems that the U.S. often has is that it, it simply, because America has this sort of universalizing ideology, the sense that, of American exceptionalism, that the United States represents a sort of global example um, that not only, you know, in one variant, that not only should be, you know, stand as an example, but should be actively exported to the rest of the world, and that the world would be a safe place for the United States if everybody else sort of looked like us. Um, uh, I think that this has given the United States a tendency to assume that its interests are the world's interests. And in the case of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia's interests. But Southeast Asian nations have, you know, they've often bristled at American hegemony in its various aspects. I would say that if you were to quiz um, Southeast Asian leaders, they would probably prefer to live under, if they had a choice, to live under American hegemony over Chinese hegemony. Um, uh, that's my guess, I'm, you know, it's just based on what I've heard from people. But I also think that they still see it as hegemony. They don't, um, they see American power, the reality of American power and what the United States had to do to establish and maintain that power in Southeast Asia, which as I mentioned involved sort of, you know, a lot of, you know, use of force. Um, um, I think they see America in a more nuanced way than Americans see themselves. Um, I think that, you know, I, I don't, to put it another way, I don't think that American exceptionalism has a lot of purchase in Southeast Asia. Um, I think that people like the United States, they desire good relations with the United States, they prefer good relations to the United States, they prefer to live under a US dominated world to a Chinese dominated world. But they also see, and they see it in, in a slightly different light than Americans see themselves. And I think that that is the gap of incomprehension between the United States and the ASEAN, um, uh, the ASEAN states and a lot of, a lot of people within them. Um, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which America's, you know, generally broadly, you know, positive uh, attitudes towards the U.S. are broadly positive amongst the publics of Southeast Asia. And I'm, you know, to the extent that this is meaningful um, in terms of foreign policy, um, you know, it is, it, is a, it is a significant advantage that the U.S. has, you know, um, the Chinese have never managed to successfully, they've never mastered the art of soft power. Um, and, and that continues to be a, a severe deficit throughout the region. Just, just, just a follow up to that. One of the things that really, really incredibly annoys Americans is when, you know, let's say Malaysia or some other country puts up a statement and we mention the US in the same sentence as China, and which, which almost like implies a, some, some of them equivalence, right? That yep. we are causing um, instability, that we are both. Almost, we, are, we are almost seeing it in people measure, of course, we don't actually mean that. But out of the need to to, uh, to hedge, to sort of like, you know, not annoy Beijing too much, we, we do have to, you know, put it in those terms. I just, I just don't know, how, 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 do you, how do we try to get America to understand that, you know, that they will not be cheered along while they try to Sort of like push back against China. That they are not. You know, we we are not going to be you know coming up with statements, welcoming every action of theirs. You know, uh, every time we do a point of and all that, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's, it's, is it? Or is the American sense of exceptionalism too strong that they will never understand this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think that that sense. I know that when Prime Minister Lee gave his speech in um, the Shingo Shingala dialogue last year. A lot of American officials were put out a bit by it because it did. He offered advice to both China and the United States and said to both powers, "You've both got to, you know, up your game. You've got to sort this out. You can't keep, you know." Uh, and I think that yeah, the implied moral equivalence is something that puts American noses out of joint. Um, even though I think, you know, it's sort of a diplomatic necessity in a certain sort of sense. Um, but yeah, I also think that it, you know, I think. To a large extent, 
the American, the hostile turn in American attitudes towards China says as much about the United States as it does about China itself. I think that there have been obviously, you know, Chinese behaviors um, uh, and practices that, that Amer Americans have a right to be concerned about. But this is also, you know, I think reflects the fact that China's economic success over the past couple of decades is a standing challenge to the idea of American exceptionalism. Um, it is a direct challenge to a lot of the ideological assumptions that, that Americans <clears throat> have held, which were burnished by the victory, of, the Americans' victory in the Cold War, which seems to sort of ratify the country's exceptional nature. Now, as it is, you know, soon to be number two economy in the world, I think this is a, you know, a source of profound and existential concern. And that has expressed itself in, in you know, um, at least helped fuel this current turn towards China. And I think you can definitely see that coming through in, you know, Secretary, Secretary of State Pompeo's comments about China as this, and, and framing of, of competition in this sort of starkly ideological terms. Um, but I don't think this is something that much of the rest of the world shares. You have a few countries that, that have a similar sort of, Australia, you see a bit of echo of that in the debates. In Europe, to an extent, but I also think this is something that, um, you know, like very few African nations um, see things in quite this light. And I think the same is true in Southeast Asia, where, you know, nations see the U.S. and China, you know, as they are. And I think, I, I think it's also important while we're talking about the U.S. to, to mention that they, they see China, Chinese self-perceptions in, in a similarly skeptical light. I mean, the Chinese are very fond of depicting themselves as sort of this beneficent, harmonious sort of... Um, you know, partner, but, you know, I think Southeast Asian nations are, you know, under no illusions about what Chinese hegemony for the region would mean. Um, and, you know, and, and they, they, they realize that it's not all going to be win-win, that ultimately, in a, you know, Chinese dominated region, Beijing would call the shots. Um, but I think, you know, anyone with this sort of sense of historical perspective would realize that that's basically what happened in the Caribbean. Um, as America's power expanded in the 19th and early 20th centuries. I mean, there was interventions, um, coercion, you know, uh, all, 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 you know, I mean, there was, this was, again, this is how big powers behave. And I think to a large extent, China and the United States um, are behave like big powers. Um, uh, and and it's, their actions are unsurprising, as is their competition. Um, even though I, I would probably prefer to live under the U U.S. dominated uh, you know, global system. I, I think that um, uh, because of the values that I think that, um, that the U.S. has, I think there is, um, you know, I think, I think this is broadly how it's seen in Southeast Asia. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, the, the next question is from Michael King. And uh, Michael's question is on the technological arms race uh, building up between the United States and China and how it could potentially affect Southeast Asia. So in your opinion, Sebastian, um, how do you see Southeast Asia fitting into this picture? And would it be more of a flashpoint or more of a salient consideration between uh, both major powers in this domain? I think Southeast Asia's, you know, the, the tech called war, as it's been termed, um, Southeast Asia's positioned itself in a very similar way um, to its positioning generally between um, China and the United States. I think it's, you know, it is been reluctant to sort of curtail um, uh, tech engagements with the United uh, with China, uh, just you know, at the request of the United States. Um, you know, the Huawei uh, example, of course, is 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 the most clear example of that. Um, uh, I think one of the problems is that you know the U.S. often makes these. You know, I, I think there's a couple of issues. One is that. I think that a lot of Southeast Asian governments realize that this is, you know, the U.S. is attempting to hamstring China rather than compete um, on the basis of, you know, um, developing American technological capacities that can compete with China. So they're not bringing anything to the table. Um, you know, when when they're when governments have been requested to turn their backs on Huawei, it's not as if U.S. negotiators or, or officials are coming to the table and saying we can offer you this in its place. And and one of the realities is that. You know, a lot of Southeast Asian governments might be very are very aware of the of the security challenges posed by Chinese technology, which are very real. Um, but 
you know, the, the, the need to adopt this 5G technology and to do so at a, a relatively cheap price and to do so earlier has pushed them to um, sign agreements with Huawei and to engage Huawei technology in a, in a variety of different ways. And so um, I think that, you know, if there is to be a sort of global bifurcation um, of, of the tech spheres, you know, into a sort of US led sphere and a Chinese led sphere, uh, you know, it's hard to see Southeast Asia going into the American camp unless there is, you know, a little bit more um, offered, uh, I guess, from, from, from the United, by the United States. Um, uh, yeah, otherwise it's sort of just, you know, a, a demand that, you know, um, it's a stick without a carrot, I guess. Um, and yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, the next question, so I think we've got quite a few questions and we might need it to go out till uh, 12 here, but we'll see how this goes. Um, is, um, are you okay with that for another 20 minutes? Yeah, I'm okay. Sure, I'm okay to go for a bit longer. Great, fantastic. So the next question is by uh, Fung Tuk. And uh, so Fung's question, oh, this is, a, this is going to be quite a curveball. Uh, so um, this quick question is, how can Southeast Asia uh, increase its uh, maneuverability amidst US-China strategic competition? Such a short, such a short question, but uh, an extremely uh, long answer to, and it's something that most of us uh, still can't figure out. So yeah. that, how do we see ourselves? Well, how long is a piece of string, I guess? I mean, you know, Southeast Asian governments, you know, I think that there's a lot of potential um, within ASEAN that hasn't been necessarily fulfilled. Um, I mean, there are limitations, but, you know, there, those limitations can be sort of pushed outwards in the presence of farsighted, uh, you know, vision, uh, leaders that have vision um, and, and are farsighted about the potential for ASEAN. I don't think ASEAN will ever become a sort of EU style block. And I think that it will probably never become a sort of anti-Chinese bulwark that a lot of Western observers would like to see it become. But I do think that there is potential to, to build on and develop those mechanisms um, in such a way as to give Southeast Asia greater room of latitude and, and to give the 10 nations and hopefully the 11, if East Timor joins, um, a vehicle for representing their interests um, in the midst of this rivalry. Um, but, you know, there's a long, you know, a, a lot of, I think a lot of ASEAN shortcomings, there's certain shortcomings that are structural and there's certain shortcomings that are a result of sort of the lack of leadership at the national level, you know, that, that, that there are, you know, there are a lot of leaders who are more interested in their own domestic concerns than in building ASEAN into, um, you know, a, a more cohesive, furthering that, that, that process of integration, which has been underway for so long. Um, so I, I, I think it's possible, but it, yeah, like I said, it requires far-sighted leadership. Uh, thank you, uh, Sebastian. And I suppose I would like to chip in with a question of my own, and it's uh, something to do with what you said earlier about China's increasing focus on the maritime domain. So, um, something, uh, one of the issues that I've been dealing with recently with conversations with colleagues across, colleagues across the region is the sort of increasing divide on a variety of uh, Southeast Asian issues between the maritime and, and the mainland countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm sort of wondering, uh, you know, in, in your view, is this uh, a sort of divide that China could possibly be exploiting, or are Southeast Asian countries ourselves uh, making such a dog's breakfast of it that uh, really uh, there's not much to exploit uh, in that sense anyway? Well, the first thing to say is that th there's no clear line of division between maritime and, and mainland. I mean, Vietnam is a mainland nation, but it has a you know a massive coastline and obviously has very strong interest in the South China Sea. Um, and I think the fact that the mainland nations are territorially contiguous with China, um, and that as I mentioned in my introduction, that that this you know, is, are increasingly integrated with um, with China economically and in terms of infrastructure links, um, will ensure that the, the Chinese presence in these regions will be will be much greater. Is likely to be much greater than in um, more historically more distant maritime parts of Southeast Asia. I do think that, you know, there is a much greater commonality of interest between the maritime nations if you add Vietnam into the mix too. Vietnam and the other in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and the Philippines 
in Brunei, um, then, then there is amongst the 10 member states as a whole, um, you know, and, and recent, you know, the last couple of years, I've heard a lot of talk from people about, you know, was it a mistake to expand ASEAN, you know, to include Myanmar, uh, Myanmar Laos and Cambodia, you know, in the 1990s. Um, and, you know, I think, well, whether or not that was a good decision, it's water under the bridge now. And, and it would have been, would have been, I think if they were not part of ASEAN, then, you know, well, it's, it's you know, one could, could posit that the Chinese influence over those countries would be all the greater. Um, so, um, but I do think this is, this does represent something of a fault line within ASEAN. Um, and, you know, again, it, to what extent this is a problem for the organization going forward, I think, um, you know, that will depend a lot on, like I mentioned before, sort of the quality of national leadership to sort of advance the organization in ways that, that safeguard the region's strategic autonomy over the long term. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, let's move on to a question by John McCarthy. And uh, John wonders, uh, you know, uh, about um, the perspective in Southeast Asian countries of the increasing emphasis uh, on, on the Five Eyes program among the uh, older um, Anglosphere countries in top dealing with, with, with China and confronting China. Um, does this uh, awaken some of the anti-colonial concerns in ASEAN that you, uh, that, 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 that you mentioned? So uh, which program was that? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, sorry, um, um, Five Eyes, the, uh, oh. the Shepherd Intelligence program of the, the, the older Anglosphere countries. Yes, um, I don't know in this specific case. I mean, it depends if the Five Eyes, I, I think one of the main concerns, that, you know, the anti-colonial reflex kicks in, in in instances where nations find themselves, you know, um, being talked down to as they perceive it by Western nations. Um, you know, I mean, I, I've certainly thought that, you know, the return of the deployment of European um, naval um, uh, um, assets into the South China Sea, you know, will certainly reawaken, at least on China's part, um, you know, memories of gunboat diplomacy of the 19th century. Um, uh, in terms of the Five Eyes, specific Five Eyes arrangements, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, I, you know, I think that that anti-colonial reflex tends to kick in in cases where involving sort of touchy issues of national sovereignty to do with political, you know, political, internal political arrangements, human rights issues, things like that. Um, you know, in this case, it's possible that it, that it will, um, you know, it might arouse the ire of some uh, intellectuals on the left in many places, but, um, you know, uh, I don't, I would guess that it probably won't feed into a, a broader anti-colonial um, revival in the region. Thank you. Um, let's move on to a question from uh, Isa Ibrahim. Uh, so um, Isa uh, refers to the point you made about uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic uh, complicating US-China rivalry. And uh, she wonders, uh, uh, she, uh, you know, and she, she would like to seek your opinion about uh, this, post this sort of pandemic and post-pandemic diplomacy, especially from China, um, when, it in when it engages with Southeast Asia using sort of its uh, soft power, soft and, 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 and economic power. Um, um, so your, your thoughts on that? How, how, uh, is this going to be a major feature in China's engagement with Southeast Asia? And will this sort of really tilt the balance uh, um, even more uh, in Beijing's favor? Well, I think that, you know, no Southeast Asian government that, you know, is going to have its concerns ameliorated, its concerns about China ameliorated just because it gets a few million respirator masks from Beijing. I think that, you know, I think that ultimately the COVID pandemic, while it's accelerated US-China tensions to a significant degree, it's going to ultimately leave the basic fundamental reality in Southeast, Southeast Asia-China relations, you know, intact. And that, that reality is economic, uh, geographic proximity. You know, that, that's not going to change. And I don't think that any Southeast Asian government is going to have its all of a sudden, you know, I mean, as I said in my introduction, you know, Southeast Asia has good reasons to be suspicious and fearful of China's intentions for the region. And I don't think that its mass diplomacy is going to override those concerns. I think that China's reputation took a little bit of a hit in the region um, 
after the pandemic escaped Wuhan and, and the, you know, the, the various bungling and administrative cover-ups that accompanied that. But at the same time, you know, if we're viewing this you know, as a dyad in connection with American perceptions of the United States in the region, the U.S. has also suffered you know, a pretty sharp decline in, you know, in terms of its own um, response to COVID-19. Um, and I think that it, the reality is that both superpowers are kind of on the nose now in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and, I, I, and that was something that was well underway before COVID hit. Um, if you look at the surveys, um, the, public, the elite public opinion surveys that um, ICAS in Singapore conducted at the end of 2019, you know, both the US and China are, you know, the, the, lack of, the amount of trust in both of these powers is, you know, was at, I'm not sure if it was all time lows, but certainly, um, you know, quite considerable lows. Uh, and I think that the pandemic has simply accelerated that. But the reality of China's presence in the region, I think, will, will weigh quite heavily in the long term. If you have, you know, now that the region is only just beginning to, to, to experience the economic downturns associated with the pandemic, and this is something that could easily spiral into political crises, like the 1997 financial crisis did. And so I think that, you know, China will you know, be an important partner by virtue of its proximity, by virtue of the economic entanglements that already exist as the region face, as the region's leaders uh, and governments face um, this coming period of economic turbulence. And I think that as soon as, you know, ch Chinese tourists can come back safely, I think they'll be probably the first that um, arrive in large numbers to the beaches of Thailand and the, the temples of um, Cambodia and so forth. And that, you know, for all the concerns people have about China, it, it will loom as an important economic partner for the region, um, just because it's close by and it's controlled the virus relatively successfully. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. Uh, we have a comment from um, David Shaw. And so um, um, David believes that you citing uh, Dr. Dr. Marte's um, Malay dilemma doesn't really fit into the context and all the issues at hand because these involve issues on two absolutely different uh, areas, and then this is in, in, in David's views. Uh, the dynamics today is vastly different from that of the 1960s. I wonder if, if, you, had a, if you had a response, or, or a, if, if any. Good dynamics in Malaysia. Uh, well, he's, 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 he's not, he's not uh, re really clear, but, but, but I think uh, he might have been referring to the sort of, uh, you know, when, when you were mentioning um, Dr. Marte, the way Dr. Marte viewed the, 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 the Malay dynamic and sort of parallels as to how Beijing uh, might, have, might have seen things as well. So mm. I, I think that that's what he had said. Well, I mean, I was citing that just as an example of the common experience of Western imperialism and, and the dis dislocations, and in the case of Malaysia, the demographic transformations that it wrought. Um, you know, I, I was just struck uh, reading um, uh, Chinese reformists from the 19th century, this sort of excoriating self-criticism that the imperial experience as China experienced it. China was never fully colonized, but it was, was you know, subjugated by the Western powers and later by Japan. Um, you know, the, 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 ex, the, the searing self-examination that this prompted and, and the, the need to kind of remake the nation uh, on, on a new footing and, 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 and really reassess shibboleths and ideas about what the Chinese empire was that were deeply ingrained. Um, you know, the, in the criticisms of Chinese culture and the Chinese people, I heard echoes of Dr. Mahathir's criticisms of the Malays and, and how they had, you know, um, failed to rise to the challenge of, of sort of the, you know, not just the challenge of the British, but also the challenge of the ethnic Chinese who came, you know, in, in, the, in the wake of British imperialism. Um, and so, yeah, that was my main point of comparison. Um, uh, but I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert on Malaysia and I don't pretend to be a specialist. And I, I, you know, I would say though that the question of, um, from my understanding, you know, the question of, um, you know, uh, the internal ethnic um, tensions in Malaysia remains very much alive. Um, a lot of the concerns that um, Mahathir expressed in that, uh, and, all the, and some of the claims he made in that book from 1970, I believe, um, you know, are still taken up by the elements of the Malay nationalist uh, right. And so, and it, and it remains sort of, that question of sort of, you know, um, 
Malayness, you know, the Malays being displaced from their own land by this, 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 these outsiders remains very much a live um, current of debate. And, I th and indeed, very, um, very, a very, um, you know, the point where I think that the rise of China could interact with Malaysian politics in potentially, um, you know, um, uh, explosive ways. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, um, Sebastian, we just got one last question. I mean, the second last question that's coming that might be, uh, that's quite interesting. It's uh, by Michael again, and uh, his question is, uh, do you think that Western states uh, and powers closer, and closer powers like China or Russia have a fundamental misunderstanding of Southeast Asia from a social cultural perspective? Uh, it, where he gives, well, in his views, for Western powers, uh, they might be too uh, short-sighted, where they view Asia only from a lens of familiarity, and what do you think the areas of improvement could be if you were to make any recommendation? Well, I think, you know, one of the problems that Western governments often have is they sort of get tangled up in their own universalism. I mean, we like to view, view ourselves as sort of exemplars or, or as, as um, you know, like of a certain political model, which is, you know, um, we, we're, we want to bring liberal democracy to the region. And one of the issues we have is I think we see every political development in Southeast Asia as, as sort of um, playing out a transition towards this sort of ideal liberal democracy, that, you know, that, that we have in our heads. Um, but I think that, you know, in many cases you see, you know, um, you know, Southeast Asian nations are all sui generis. They all have their own um, ways of viewing political power that, that often diverge quite dramatically from, from Western models. Um, and so I think that one of the, you know, I talk, talk about in the book, one of the sort of the, the forms of blindness I think that the United States has is that it is constantly seeing like the latest protest movement or the latest election result as sort of a, a, an sort of emanation of, or, or as, as the playing out of um, a certain sort of linear political um, process of development. Um, that's what we talk about transitions to democracy. We're talking about sort of like, you know, a very clean and uni linear process. Um, and I think that the reality is often a lot more messy. I mean, I'll, if I take the example of Malaysia, in 2018, when Dr. Mahathir, you know, led the PH coalition to victory, you know, quite a remarkable, you know, development, as you all agree. Um, a lot of Americans viewed that as sort of like a, you know, a win for democracy against authoritarianism. But as you know, as you guys know, it's, it's a hell of a lot more complicated than that. I mean, um, Mahathir was one of the most active um, participants in the Asian values debate of the 1990s. And he, he rejected very strongly the sense that the West represents a sort of political, universal political model and he was very hostile towards Western powers that lectured him about how he should run his country's affairs. Um, and I think that again and again, we see, you know, at, at Western policy made on these assumptions tends to create tensions and complications in its relationship with Southeast Asian nations. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not call, I, I don't think that Western nations should just take values off the table. I think that there is a room to just talk about human rights and, questions of political development in their relationships with foreign countries. But I think they underestimate the extent to which this often seems condescending. And I think it's also one of the things that I, I argue against in the book, sort of between the lines, is this assumption that if we promote democracy and spread democracy, then that's a strategy for meeting the challenge posed by China. And I think that, you know, if we were, if we could wave a magic wand, and transform every nation in Southeast Asia into a functioning consolidated liberal democracy, that might actually be to some extent true. The question is how we get there. And, and democratic development is a hugely complex and unpredictable process. And I think it's one that we, you know, in many ways don't understand even that well in our own, in the case of our own societies. Um, and so I think that, yeah, policy made on the grounds, on, on those bases is always going to create complications. Um, and so I think that, you know, I, I don't think that China necessarily understands Southeast Asia better. I mean, in some ways, China is very blind in itself, and it's, 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 it's got its, you know, huge amount of blind spots in, in how it 
interacts with the region. But I think one thing it does have is pragmatism. It, it, it isn't burdened by a sort of ideological assumption about how human development operates. I mean, I suppose one could, could, could argue that it has a certain ideological attachment to state-led economic development, but the Chinese are very experimental and very pragmatic. Um, and I think that they're able to, you know, um, you know, they're, and, and this is why the, the, the sort of non-interference um, sort of uh, mantra is constantly welcomed in the region. Um, I, one Thai foreign Thai minister, a former Thai minister said to me that, you know, the Chinese are a lot easier to deal with. Um, doesn't mean that they're not a concern uh, or, or that China's power is not a concern, but in terms of, you know, maintaining a diplomatic relationship, it's, you know, um, there's a certain commonality of um, perceptions about the global order and perceptions about national sovereignty and, and, and the way that nations interact. Thanks, uh, Sebastian. So we are down to our last five minutes. Uh, and, and on that answer, it's a, it's a perfect segue to what is going to be our last question of the day. Uh, by Riz, uh, Riz Jackson, and Riz wonders you know, if you could sit down with uh, folks like Trump or Biden or Johnson or Macron or even uh, Merkel, what would your what top single piece of advice be on how to engage Southeast Asia uh, about China? And, and, and Sebastian, do you have any additional concluding remarks to make? Um, the floor is yours. Yeah, well, I, I think that since American Southeast Asia policy seems to be down, seems to exist downstream of its China policy, I'd probably ask them to reassess their China policy. Um, but of course, I, you know, how the U.S. handles China is, is an incredibly complex question. I don't think there's a clear answer. I mean, I guess I would say to eschew ideological absolutes. Um, I don't think that um, uh, China is not the old Soviet Union. It, it, it has a different view of itself. And, and while I think that she is very ideologically ambitious in certain ways, it's not seeking to export an ideological model in the way that the, that the Soviet Union and Mao's China did in the, in the 60s and 70s. Um, and I think that, you know, you need to be much more uh, sensitive to the concerns of the actual, of Southeast Asian governments um, and to you know, to, to, to listen to what they're, you know, to actually see what their interests are and, and how you can help advance those interests through your relationship with them. Um, but I think that, you know, the idea that the whole region can be turned into an anti-China bloc um, is, you know, is fantasy. I mean, it's not going to happen. And I think that, um, you know, there needs to be, basically, you know, they need to understand how Southeast Asian nations view China and, and the complexity and of their relationships with it, um, that that makes it very difficult for them to get on board with this, you know, this sort of starkly ideological approach. Now, hopefully, that will improve during the Biden administration. I don't think we're going to go back to the, the pre-Trump era of engagement with China, but I do think we're going to see. Hopefully, we'll see a more cohesive, uh, level-headed approach to competition with China that that eschews zero-sum rhetoric and. Um, you know, uh, you know, holds out the possibility of cooperation with China on areas of mutual interest. But, you know, one concern I have is that this, this American perception of, you know, a, a tendency to frame um, power struggles in these ideological terms is not just, I think that Pompeo has been particularly simplistic in his language, but this is something that exists across the American political spectrum. It's an American tendency that, that we, you know, um, and so I think that, you know, it's likely to continue. And on the Chinese side as well, you have a government that perceives the United States as trying to contain it. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's taking actions, you know, it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy, this obsession that the Chinese Communist Party has with, you know, containment and being hemmed in by the United States and that the U.S. has always wanted to sort of keep China down. Um, China is now taking actions um, and doing things that only you know, ensure that that will be the case. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a worrying situation. Um, but once we get beyond November and, and the news, you know, hopefully if, if Joe Biden wins, we'll, we'll see at least a lull in, the, in the, the, the kind of daily escalations that we've seen over the past you know, year.
All right. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a nice day. I don't know whether that is an optimistic or a not so optimistic ending to it, uh, but that's cool. Uh, we, know we, yeah. we, 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 will, we will call it as it is. Uh, before I hand it over to Shariman to formally close, just a couple of very quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, I do apologize to the, the, the couple of other questions that we couldn't get to. My apologies for that. Um, now, we will probably upload this on our website uh, within a day or two, so do stay tuned to our social media if you're interested. And uh, just a reminder that uh, Sebastian's very uh, so, uh, extensive bio, as well as the link to the books, uh, both on Amazon and for those of you who are here in Malaysia to um, Tino Kunia in KL, uh, are available in the Zoom uh, webinar chat function. Uh, we'll probably uh, link them up when we upload, the, upload the, the, the video recording of this as well. So, uh, thanks again, Sebastian. I'll hand it over to Shariman. Um, not, not much to say except um, the book is In the Dragon Shadow, South Asia in the Chinese Century, uh, published by Yale University Press. Uh, if you are in a bookstore and if you don't see Sebastian's book, walk out because that's not a good bookstore. Um, it is very well researched. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the notes are expensive. But for me, the, the great thing about it is the color that Sebastian brings to the whole um, analysis. I mean, uh, this is one of, one of the advantages when uh, it's a book is written by a journalist who actually talks to people other than uh, engages in some theoretical sort of uh, investigation. Um, uh, and you know, thanks uh, very much, Sebastian. And uh, we look forward to you know, having another webinar with you uh, some, sometime soon again. Yeah. Of course. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. It was a privilege. Thank you. Um, Thank you. You don't mind um, staying back for a bit. And... Sure. Sure. No problem. Okay. No. So apparently we can we can leave everyone out. Um, but you know, thanks again, Mister. We'll we'll be in touch, all right? Um, yeah. For sure. Yeah. No. Again, I thanks for um, thanks for inviting me. It was a, a really interesting discussion. So. And, um, yeah. I hope to see you in KL um, sometime soon. I, I I don't know when travel will reopen, but um, as soon as it does, it would be a uh, it would be a pleasure to catch up again for a drink. Fantastic! Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll do a, we'll we'll try to do an event here as well, right? Yes. Um, yeah. I hope. Anyway, Sebastian, we'll 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 uh, we'll turn this off. All right. Bye. All the best. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks again. Bye.